Hey, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 718. That is Siete Uno Ocho, I think it is in Espanol. Siete Uno Ocho with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I really do hope you're doing swimmingly because I'm doing pretty decently, all things considered. I cannot complain. I really, really cannot complain. How have I been? I've been pretty decent. Um, been a bit of a slow weekend for me in terms of social life and stuff. I haven't really been doing much in terms of the going out. I had big plans as per usual to go out to many, many things and big up my night service crew. I was meant to go out and check their party out, flipping and fold. Um, I forgot how he pronounced his name, Setio Mac. Um, I forgot how he pronounced the guy's name. Please do forgive me. Um, he was performing at fold. I was meant to go to that. Um, there was a few other things happening. SPF DJ playing, I think at venue MOT all night long, a night that I bought a ticket for previously, but it got canceled. Blah, 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 blah. Many things, many plans. None of it also went through. Um, a kind of really depressing part of all this kind of planning stuff and never going through like i'm in a good place now in the past i was like buying tickets feverishly and i think that was maybe my fomo um maybe my um you know my natural reaction to feeling like you know my going out days are behind me and i'm kind of wanting to you know drastically and you know hurriedly kind of hold on to it i would go and buy tickets right i would buy loads of tickets to events and i'd never go to them so i'd have all these tickets of you know in my flipping um wallet app or on my ra account that i would never go to and end up having to give them away on various groups or just you know find a random person on social media that was complaining about not being able to go and send it to them um and it's funny because th there's been many a time where i've done that and the person's been like no nah, i'm not actually going so people love to talk a big game like i do online but they actually never follow through so it's interesting to see which kind of adds to my overall theory that you should probably never buy tickets ahead of time for anything unless it's some like big ticket person like a superstar like a bad bunny a drake a madonna or whatever it may be who's you know who's, got, who's on tour at the moment you should probably hold off and buying tickets ahead of time for everybody because most of the time people will buy tickets they'll flake or they'll flip and have second you know thoughts about it or they'll change their mind they'll invent some new excuse and they won't go like i have done in the past or people will talk a big game about it online and act like they want to go but they won't follow through and buy the ticket so more times than not if you are patient and you just chill, you can probably get the tickets to go somewhere. Like I can't think of many places I've been to in my life where it's really been, you have no ticket, you can't come in. It doesn't happen. Usually if you've got the will and you've got the money, you'll find a way. Always people will let you in, especially if you just turn up at the event. It's a bit risky, of course, but you know, what's the point of living a life where you're just at home and everything's being handed to you on a fucking silver platter? You might as well go and risk it. But I've rarely, if ever, been turned away from a venue in London with no ticket and just turn up with some money and say, hey, can I come in? And usually after a bit of haranguing and stuff and checking people, blah, 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 asking questions, they'll usually let you in anyway. So um, that is nice to see. But it has been a little bit depressing because, you know, I haven't been going out as much as I would probably want to, which is maybe a good thing because I think I should really be focusing more on doing my DJ mixes, which I still haven't done. I should be focusing more on trying to go to do these trips abroad, which I still haven't focused on. Um, I've actually got one planned already for November, but until that's booked, I'm not going to be speaking about that because I was speaking about many, many trips I was meant to go on the weekend and never follow through. So until that November one's actually booked, I'm not going to speak about it. But I guess it's just the nature of the beast in it. And more time you have available to do these other things, it probably is no coincidence so now my output in terms of pods in terms of live streams in terms of patreon posts has definitely increased because i haven't been going out as much so i guess it's one of those things you give up one thing and obviously increases the other but then also the other thing kind of suffers but i'm gonna try and you know remedy that by adding in a few more pirate studio sessions and make it those maybe twice a month because i need to do that quite often more than not to basically put myself out there and just to play music it's just fun you know forget the putting stuff out there to get bookings, which is obviously amazing right i'm not complaining and i won't reject it if somebody says hey you play amazing come play at my festival or something or come play at my club have a residency i'm not turning that down but i think it's important to just like do stuff that you enjoy and that you find fun and obviously djing for me is a really good hobby i've always said it's one of the funnest hobbies in the world because it can legitimately be just something you do for fun for like 10 people watching you on a live stream or one listening to you on soundcloud or it can legitimately be something that you do as a career and it takes you all around the world and suddenly you're in these cool amazing places playing for you know interesting people in new locations you've never been at all this malarkey meeting all your heroes blah 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 it's gonna be fun so let's see how that plays out but that's something that i'm aiming aiming to do 100 1 million 100 percent
But anyway, let's crack on with the, with the show. Quick one today because I wanted just to get this one out to you um, for the start of the week. The first thing to mention here is I'm actually surprised this shoe is not dying or this boot is not dying. But then I just thought about it before I started the show. I was thinking the margins on this shoe must be so insane. They're just probably printing money at this rate because it's such a mean sh it's such a meme shoe there's really if there's really is nothing of importance attached to it um design or culture or art in general nowadays is on a bit of a it's in a bit of a plateau you listen to new music coming at the moment nothing's really hitting you the way it should do art isn't really taking you where it needs to take you yeah, movies are a bit bland tv series are even worse it's all a bit shit out there so when somebody does create a really great meme product that kind of just captures the imagination of the internet for a couple of weeks i understand why they want to just absolutely rinse that towel dry but the design artistic creative side of me is like come on bro this is getting a bit too much now and i'm talking about the mischief big red boot it's now going to come out in black to me this feels like when i started to dislike jeff staple when jeff staple was out here just peddling that fucking pigeon dunk color motif story theme on every fucking thing that he did he built an entire brand off of the back of fucking the pigeon dunk and he still won't shut up about it to this day Do you know i mean it's like a one trick pony thing um or like a fucking you know one hit one hit wonder and it feels the same thing with mischief like they've not really been known for anything else even though they've done loads of cool interesting sh um, designs products activations marketing things one of the biggest things that they've ever done that really cemented their name out here has been this big red boot and obviously the big red boot had had this big moment on social media everyone was wearing it the whole i, I actually liked the thing how it became like a story about where to find it how it came delivered how to put it no how it worked with outfits how to wear it um how to take it off they all became little memes in itself and it kind of maybe went above and beyond the kind of five minutes of fame that it's meant kind of meant to have but then after people started to customize them i saw somebody try to paint them into tim's there was a horrible bape collabo the horrible crocs collabo all these little things came out and they slowly but surely diluted it and kind of ran its course and kind of you know basically um wore, wore the whole thing out and then now um the black the black version of the boots coming out and it's quite interesting because the, the cool kids who I felt like made the big red boot kind of cool. There was this one particular girl who got it first. I think she might have been the same model on the cover of Her Loss. Um, Drake and 21 Savage's uh, collab album. I think that might have been the girl or somebody else. But I remember when the big red boot came out, that activation and that seeding program for the big red boot was really good i feel like they put it especially regardless of some of the other guys i think there was a couple of older white dudes who were a bit cringy and you know not really something to my taste but there were some other people that they kind of tapped into like i said like ig models um ig kind of street style kids whatever they may be who i thought really made those big red boots look cool and kind of added um a little bit of cool factor a little bit of um she wouldn't say chicness but something to the shoe or something to the boot then obviously as more and more people started to get hold of it it started to become more and more corny it legitimately started to play out in real time you start to see it go from being something kind of cool something that you might consider buying just as something to have in your wardrobe or something a bit dumb and silly to so put on during a halloween thing or something to put on randomly on your you know on a friday casual friday to work something to get a laugh out of your fucking colleagues whatever right it suddenly came into something that looks a bit like oh this is kind of i'm kind of over this now very quickly which is which is annoying because the power of the internet is that you can spread and disseminate your ideas really quickly. But obviously the con of it is also, it can also die out really quickly. Your trends or the, the, the trends associated with the product you make, I'm sure people don't go into it trying to create their own trends, but the product, product you make in the hope of being popular can, can be swallowed up by the trend cycle and it become very bland um, very quickly and everyone could kind of be over it. So that's the problem they're kind of having. So although this boot is probably looks the best in the red and the black so far that we've seen especially when you think about an anime characters and stuff and manga characters it's all going to be bright or like basic black boot type of style especially with the white sock and shit it will look quite cool and i'm sure the black will um not crack as much as some of the other colorways i'm sure because of this being uh, made a certain way i think it's a pu sort of mixture like resin whatever I'm sure they're able to inject the pigment into the rubber or the plastic to make it, you know, to make it hold a little bit better. So I'm sure the quality will be a lot better on these in terms of the wear and tear. But still, you know, I'm kind of over it. 
we all should be over it by now, but I guess we're not. So let's read the article now. It says, Mischief and his big red boot to some is a combination of evokes a pure burst of playful nostalgia. To others, instead, it's a dread. If you had an internet connection to any point in February of this year, it was February. It feels like it's been two years now. It's only February the, the red boot came out. God damn. Um, which is quite a good idea in it. February, uh, Valentine's month. It makes sense to put it there. If you had an internet connection at some point in February this year, you would saw the, the mega viral design dominate social media. Naturally, Mischief has harnessed the momentum. It garnered um, generated story from the Big Red Boot to introduce um, the cross collaboration, a restock of the original red, and now this reveal of an all black version of the shoe. Aside from the color swap, the notable differences exist in the predecessor in red. Unique shape returns of a simple Mischief and the hit on the outside. So for those looking to embrace a mission big red boot in this all black rendition get ready to schedule um for the launch which is october 26th at 2 p.m and it's going to be a retail price of 350 dollars god damn they are not playing cheap with this thing another thing i think i would have probably respected more in terms of design element would be if like imagine they put this out and they put it out and it was like reimagined or re-engineered right in terms of oh we we saw your feedback maybe how hard people found put taking the putting the shoe one taking it off maybe the fact that maybe the soul gave way after a certain period of time i don't know whatever introductions they could have done i think that would have been a far cooler thing to see maybe they added some kind of you know ventilation to it whatever the would the complaints were with the shoe um i would have maybe liked to have seen a little bit more sort of um, work go into kind of updating them to the point where they would become a little more durable or they kind of um, do away with some of the issues that people had when they were wearing them in the first place. So again, reinforced sole, maybe cutting the length of them a little bit, ventilation, whatever it may be. But hey, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I guess not broke, don't fix it. If you want a pair, like I said, October 26th, um, they're going to be available for 350 USD, which is pretty crazy. I'm assuming they'll probably be the same price in um, pounds because usually the conversion rate now is the same. So check those out if you want. Check those out if you want and if you please. Next, we've got this story courtesy of The Independent. And I've seen this story, various versions of the story be spoken about many, many times. And maybe it's the same thing being regurgitated but i think i want to offer like a different perspective on why i think this may be an issue and why it's happening quite often so headline is courtesy of the independent it says drunken brits could be banned from spain's Balearic islands and if you scroll down to the main story it says drunken revelers could be banned from the party island of ibiza under new um, plans being considered by the local officials to crack down on antisocial behavior by tourists according to reports tourists who break strict rules could be blacklisted from notorious party hotspots at the Balearic islands such as the magaluf in mallorca and the west end of san antonio in abitha um wham what's that wame uh, bwauza the island's head of tourism suggested that holidaymakers who break strict rules could be ordered to go home. Speaking to local media on Monday after meeting yesterday of the Commission of Promotion of Civism um, in tourist zones, Mr. Boaza said it would be it would depend on the specific quote unquote crime or interfraction committed, whether or not badly behaved tourists could be sent packing. And this should be no surprise to most people who go to like those type of places to holiday. Um, I've never really been around the kind of like, I went to, what, what's that thing called? I went to Fort Ventura, but that was outside of the kind of peak party season type of thing. But I've never been to Balearic Islands when it's like full on, you know, um, season time, let's go, let's have it, blah, de, blah, blah, blah. But I have been on planes um where people are going to those type of things like you know in the in in the airport where people are going to those type of flights but i've never actually been on a flight itself and one thing i noticed i was really surprising was just how much turn up the airport is because i've never really been like to an airport when it's like that type of time so i've never really known that to be a thing i always assumed everybody treat whole airports like i do where i treat an airport similar to how i treat like a police station even if i'm going there um voluntarily i'm still a little bit worried you know i'm still a little bit nervous i'm still a little bit scared whatever it may be and i'm treating it with some level of reverence and respect i'm not going in there thinking it's just a fucking job interview or i'm going to hang out with some friends i'm thinking of it hey if this goes left and i answer these questions wrong even if i'm not guilty or anything i could maybe end up in jail or something i could be one of those kind of um 
you know, cautionary tales of be careful to not go to places and voluntarily because you might end up in jail and you're there for like the next fucking 60 days or something. I don't know. I've just always kind of treated airports with a level of respect where I kind of know that when I'm going there, I'm going there primarily to get to my location. It's not a place for me to have fun. It's not a place for me to kind of fall around and joke and do whatever. If anything, I'm so preoccupied, so nervous about getting there on time, so nervous, so preoccupied about checking that I've got my passport, you know, double checking, triple checking, you know, I, I can't I can't count the amount of times I've gone to the airport and I've actually checked maybe more than ten times on the train itself if I've got my if I've got my passport. Just in case. But okay, cool. Just in case I got I haven't got it, I can rush back and get it, but whatever. And I know I have it in my pocket, but I keep checking anyway. So all those nerves, all that anxiety is something that I've always kind of held within me, especially when it comes to airports, because in my everyday life I'm quite lackadaisical. I, I you know I I, I, I'm kind of laid back I'm a little bit Jamaican in that way people kind of use it as a flipping insult in terms of like you know don't worry don't be afraid because every little thing is gonna be all right so I don't want to have that same perspective when I go to the airport because the punishment is far greater you go to the airport late you miss your fucking check-in time the gates close and you have now having to pay like crazy money to get another flight out right very rarely if you miss a flight can you get the flight for under what you paid it's always going to be double or triple what you paid and if it's a low budget airline like a Ryanair or an EasyJet going to a bait place in Europe the last thing you want to do is pay 500 euros for it you know what I mean you're not going to fucking the USA you're going to Berlin you're going to Paris you're going to Madrid you're going to Barcelona the whole reason why you're going there is because they're not too far from where you are and obviously the price isn't too shabby so I don't want to be a put in a position where I have to overpay for a ticket so I go abide by the rules I get there for four hours ahead of time like a psycho I have fucking movies downloaded on my phone movies downloaded on my laptop I watch and listen to those things or podcasts or read a book or whatever or people watch and just chew until my flight gets there and if I need to sleep I might sleep on a plane or my sleep wagon when I get there but I'm not doing the whole like oh I'm gonna get there and get turned up so when I do go to airports and see people who are going to these locations and they're turned it's pretty mind-blowing because you don't ever see it usually right you've seen people got treating an airport like they'll treat a train station as if they're going on a train to fucking Liverpool street you're like wow man I didn't know this was possible and one thing I remember surprised me that even when I came back from the from the Fort Ventura is seeing the amount of people that were getting the in-flight food and drinks because I've never seen anybody order it because I'm usually going again to random places to do my little techno tourism thing but a lot of people I'm flying with at that time especially during the weekend it feels like a lot of people that maybe kind of travel back and forth from the countries maybe for business maybe visiting families or doing what I'm doing a little bit of tourism a little bit of techno tourism so they're usually going to the place to have their fun they don't need to get lit on the plane but on the way back from Fort Ventura the amount of people that were ordering cocktails and drinks and beers and wines and food on the plane was wild like it took that car normally in any other flight that i get on no one really orders anything they might see the odd person here and there grab a coke or something or a coffee but that car that they had in the middle of ryanair it took ages for it to get to the back where i was sitting because it was just like every row was ordering something like this and that and you know as per usual people's on those type of flights they don't seem to have the ability to just eavesdrop on other people's um order choices or to see what the air students is saying in terms of what's available and every time they came to their row oh can you tell me what the options are can you tell me what the options are it's like bro that person was just in front of you in the row in front didn't you couldn't you just eavesdrop and find out what the options were and just make a note of it to make the job easier it's just you went to everyone wanted like a per, to personally be told what the options were and there were like eight or ten of them it was fucking hilarious so i can understand how so the reason why i bring this up is because i can see what it's like on the planes and i'm not even on direct flights there right so i can imagine i can only imagine what it's like with the direct flights and i can only imagine what it's like when they land at these places they must be turned to level 11 so i understand some of the concerns that these guys have with british tourists um it continues it says i've expressed the masters um lines and nothing rule being ruled out or confirmed at this stage then it will need to have a legal framework says um he told the diary diario the abisa um the main thing is to target companies as well but above all these people who behave in a way that is not tolerable and here or anywhere news um new laws introduced in some parts of balerics in 2020 in a separate bid to clamp down on badly behaved tourists on bills viewed holidays the decree banned happy hours free bars and two-for-one drinks parties that made it illegal to advertise pub crawls they've, they've got an interesting issue in it because you'd imagine a huge chunk a huge chunk of their kind of money that they make is basically based on tourist 
right? They don't probably generate that much else outside of tourism season or maybe all year round from tourism. So they probably have to tread a bit lightly. They know these guys are a liability. They know they're not the greatest advertisement of our country, especially exports. Um, they know they cause people hassle, really. Maybe sometimes it's more hassle than what it's worth. But buying, you know, the bottom line is these guys contribute to the bottom line. The guys that go on pub crawls, the ones that want two for one drinks, happy hours, all these type of things, they're the ones that really go out there and spend, spend, spend. Because something as well, you can't, you know, kind of begrudge British people for. We might be liabilities tourism wise, but we're also not people that are tight with our money when we do go out. When we do go out, like each person is spending probably a minimum of two hundred dollars or two hundred euros a night out, or maybe even a hundred euros, maybe each person, and it's usually groups of people. So imagine what that is times five times ten. It's crazy amounts. Um, the regional government also banned new licenses for party boats, while existing boats are banned from operating in design designated areas. Sorry. Meanwhile, shops selling alcohol that stay open all night were ordered to close between nine thirty p.m. and eight a.m. or risk fines of up to six hundred thousand or the threat of being closed down for three years. Torres. Tour, tour, sorry, tourist, tourist court climbing on hotel balconies can be kicked out and face hefty fines. Um, the restrictions applied um, to the worst affected areas in Magaluf, El Arena del Plama in Mallorca, and Sant Antonio de Port, Man, de, de Port Mani in um, Ibiza. Ibiza is Balearic Islands among some of tourism dependent regions with the industry accounting a large part of the country GDP. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because I also feel like part of the reason why this happens it has to do a lot more with the restrictions out here in the UK. I feel like because the UK is so far behind in terms of drug safety, in terms of, you know, sensible um, adult grown up um, approaches to drinking and nightlife in general, we're not really used to drinking and doing drugs and going out and having a good time. It's hard to say this, but we're kind of infantile in that approach because we have such a short window to party most places don't stay open past 3 a.m um let alone four or six or whatever it may be uh, most people don't leave their homes until maybe 9 10 11 um and then by the time you're going out you're probably already due to come back home in about three or four hours so you have to kind of get all you you know get as much as you can out of the night um god forbid if you have kids and you don't usually go out anyway so there's extra pressure to make it worthwhile because maybe you don't have the time the money to pay for childcare or whatever maybe don't be away from your kids too often and now suddenly you're turning what could be just a random chill night out into okay this has to be project x and it doesn't need to be that but again the timings around it um the lack of infrastructure to allow you to get back home at sensible out all these type of things kind of affect um the situation that we have in the uk which is why sometimes i always think to myself especially in london maybe because the transport system is so good that's why i've always kind of thought to myself like i'm actually surprised we don't have as crazy high of drink driving offenses as we probably should considering how shitty our licensing laws are considering the tightness of the opening hours considering how you know drug addled and alcoholic you know of a country we are the fact that we don't have more people you know getting into serious serious um accidents um you know being intoxicated behind the wall is an actual miracle maybe again it's the fact that there's ubers and taxis and public transport especially in most parts of london readily available and maybe smaller parts smaller towns outside london not so much but still that might maybe account for it not being as high as it should be but i really do think if we had more grown-up approach to drinking and going out maybe this wouldn't be an issue if people could actually go out and spend six to eight hours out and have a good time and pace themselves they wouldn't need to go to the Balearic Islands and steam themselves and I think this is kind of a representative of what happens in clubs in clubs or in bars in London because they all close at the same time you have this weird purge I'm sure if you were to stand um you know at liverpool street around 3 a.m you see like hordes of people just flooding the streets all at the same time because there's no real staggered you know release or closing everyone closes at the same time they push in the limit right to the end so by the time everybody kind of fills out into the streets right um there's nowhere else to go because everywhere's closed and people are drunk and you know high whatever they may be acting out they want to impress their other mates or people just around them they start engaging in such a behavior that leads to trouble police come the cycle continues but in other places where maybe the opening hours are a bit more lax or a bit more open a bit more free what ends up happening is that you have people leaving at all hours of the night because the bars are open a little earlier they're, they're obviously closing way 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 later you have people being able to leave at one three four six eight nine ten a.m in the morning so that the 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 flow of people leaving isn't crazy there's not as much antisocial behavior on the street because people get to kind of like you know um de-steam themselves right um they get to have a little bit of a 
pre calm down in the actual club or the bar itself and then by the time they're on their way home all they want to do is sleep and you don't get that so that's why people probably decide when they go abroad okay we're gonna have it we're gonna fucking have it we're not playing any games let's fucking go and that's what probably basically leads to the trouble that they're actually having over there which is a shame but i guess again you know it takes effort it takes a little bit of self-reflection it takes a little bit of honesty to see that you know the issues that we are having are maybe created by the government as a mission they're obviously not going to do that so this issue will keep kind of happening again and again so i understand why the Blair islands are like you know what we have to step in now because the uk government aren't doing what they need to do so i completely completely understand that Moving on, we've got this quick topic to talk about regarding Patrick Mason's interview with uh, Playful Magazine. Now, Playful Magazine has been getting a bit of stick from my side of, you know, social media or my side of the internet, especially when it comes to clubs and stuff, because of maybe how lackluster some people think the interviewer is, right? The host of the show. Um, I don't necessarily mind her. If anything, I feel like sometimes she does come across as if like her mind is elsewhere when she's interviewing some people. Um, sometimes the research isn't really up to par or deserving of of the artists that they're interviewing because they get some fucking fantastic guests right this 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 um, web website uh, called playful magazine it's an online magazine and they've also got a youtube channel where they have interviews with loads of people from the dance music scene um that i'm obviously a fan of and people that i kind of want, want to get to know and bloody blah 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 it's mostly based in berlin if i'm not mistaken so you can kind of get an idea of the kind of people that they're going to focus on there and the host the lady here on the left again does a fairly decent enough job i think her affable uh bubbly cheerful personality i think kind of helps because she doesn't come into it being too much of a chin stroker where sometimes a lot of these journalists in dance music are sort of like what i would deem to be like um you know like when in stand-up comedy where you have these people who maybe are super critical you know they, they, yeah sometimes super critical stand-ups and their positions on certain issues in society and shit and then you'll find out oh this person's like a failed stand-up so essentially a lot of these failed stand-up comedians could kind of usually go into this weird uh, kind of social justice lane um and then start pulling up other comedians because it never quite worked out for them so i don't ever get the feeling that this lady's like a failed dj who never really made it and is now kind of trying to you know put herself to be the most pop you know important person in the world by interviewing people i think a lot of the ra journalists back in the day had that sort of like vibe about them where they thought they were way too important than what they actually were i think she plays a position really well she's here as the host she's here as the interviewer kind of um she's there to create like a part fun positive type of vibe i just would have wished she'd just have a little bit more researched a little bit more you know um research go into interviewing the person apart from wikipedia entries or just whatever first link she read on google um maybe a little bit more engagement and connection with the artist because sometimes again like i said maybe it's a personality but she seems like sometimes she's a bit like off in the clouds but apart from that i feel like the reason why they probably get all the guests on the show is partly because of her because she's really laid back and chill so it's kind of a double-edged sword if you want a more journalistic if you want a little more in, uh, investigative, investigative, a little bit, I wouldn't say confrontation, but a little bit more of a interview interview, you're probably not going to get the artists that she's interviewing because they don't want to speak like that, right? They they probably have really horrible takes. Um, they're probably not the most self-aware people in the world. Um, so you don't want them to speak about certain things because they're going to really end up kind of getting trashed online, losing fans and having a lot of headache for nothing. So they probably need to have this person be a little bit more laid back and chill and they can kind of be themselves. Anyway, long story short, they have this little series on there um on a date with patrick mason at glitch festival what happened recently and or this past summer sorry and um patrick mason made a really interesting comment regarding his appearance at printworks for an afterlife event right and i was kind of surprised when i did see his name on the fly i'm not gonna lie there's been a few of these festivals and events happening around where i see patrick mason's name on flies i've been like hmm i wonder was this just a cash grab was this just him trying to like prove himself on that platform because there didn't seem to be any real synergy behind what he does who he is as an artist as a dj with what these promoters are doing and at the time i thought to myself this feels a little bit like tokenism right it feels like they're kind of using him for how he looks using him from what he represents to sort of make their party look like they're more forward thinking more progressive more accepting and bloody blah 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 and diverse quote unquote than they actually are and i'm glad that he said what he said because i think you know you can use the whole like you can use the fact that some places want to tokenize you to your advantage right him being a mixed race guy him playing music the way he plays um him being a gay guy all these things are important parts of his identity but some people could use them as ways to kind of make themselves look a little bit more progressive than what they actually are but i feel like in dance music because it's so competitive because it's such a um cutthroat industry you kind of have to use everything 
that's available to you to get forward. You really have to. It's really sad to say that, but it kind of is the case. So you can use it to your advantage, but sometimes there comes a point where it's like the juice isn't worth the squeeze because a bit of your humanity, your dignity gets stripped away from you when people keep tokenizing you in a way and not seeing you as a person. So I'm glad he said what he said. So let's play the clip of Patrick Mason basically talking about how he found his agent um, from um, obviously the work he did at Printworks and he kind of briefly speaks about how it didn't go too well, that gig, and why he did wasn't a fan of it. The story, the first time we encountered each other was last year when I played Printworks uh, for Afterlife, which was more of an... <clears throat> complicated endeavor <laughs> um, but he was the, uh, the stage manager at that time and he was the one and only person who was taking care of me proper care of me and made me feel secure and welcome mm. at, um, a, a, yeah, a venue I didn't feel fitted for you know I felt I was like uh, yeah a bit tokenized I have to say mm. oh um, wow so I was like okay yeah I'm gonna do the gig I Anyone at the entire lineup was playing a completely different sound, you know what Afterlife is about. And I did the exact opposite because, you know, you book me for me, I'm not gonna play like down tempo, uh, no. <laughs> atmospheric, melodic tech house. So um, I brought the vibes and I felt like, okay, I played also downstairs, so in the Inkwell, I think, was the, uh, is the second stage. The vibe was, inc was incredible, like the people were very giving and the English crowd is always very much uh, on fire. <laughs> But he was the one... Shout out to British people. Shout out to all the Brits down there. And um, yeah, he gave me like a very good feeling of security and of awesome. welcoming. Nice and um, two months or three months later, I had um, a meeting in Ibiza with this, uh, the ex-tour manager of Adam Bayer, who is now starting his own um, agency for tour management and production. Really? And yes, exactly. And what did you do with them? Anyway, you get the gist of it, right? So interesting comment to make. Um, first off, it's probably unfortunate that he got hired to do an afterlife party at Printworks because Printworks at the time is closed now, but it was probably up there with one of our most commercial venues in the world or commercial venues in the UK, similar to like a really big fabric. So he was always going to be up against it, especially if it being an afterlife party, especially being if it being in Printworks. There wasn't much synergy there to be had. But I do respect the bravery to be like, you know what, you booked me to, you booked me for me. So I'm not going to change how I play to fit with your crowd because if you've heard Patrick Mason's sets, you will know it's not melodic house. It's not atmospheric house. It's not tech house. It's not nothing to do with all those things that they want you to play in those type of places. It's complete opposite of it. And if anything, it's the complete, um, it's like the complete opposite of what anybody in there will be into. Because I feel like a lot of techno people who are into basically Patrick Mason would not be into deep house or tech house. It's a completely different scene. The, the, you know, the values, how they dress, the outlook on the world, it's just completely different. So it's a very interesting and bizarre way for them to try to introduce him to their audience in the first place. So that's why I'd be curious to know from the booker or whoever it is who put him forward, why they thought it'd be a good option anyway. Was it a purposeful thing because it wanted to maybe branch out and not have it always be tech house, tech house? Or was it really just a thing of like, okay, cool, here's this guy. He ticks the quota, right? Half white, half black. We can kind of fill that quota out. Um, he represents um, the gay community, the queer community, LGBTQ community. Cool, that checks the box off and he plays his techno shit if it was just a numbers game or if it was just them being a little bit more, hey, let's be a little bit more open-minded, open this thing out to other people. I'm not being too sure. But like I said, I'm I like the bravery because if you've been to places before, if you ever performed or DJ places, you'll know how kind of nerve wracking it is to be booked somewhere for one thing. No, book somewhere that plays one particular genre. You get asked then to play your own stuff there. And then you go in there before you're there early, you're hearing other people play. It can be quite nerve wracking to get up on the booth and start to play your own shit because you know the people that are there are only there for a specific sound. So to have the guts to just stick to your sound says a lot about how much you trust your artistry, where you are in terms of your career and stuff, and just your confidence overall. And you just kind of, you know what, I don't give a fuck. However, this goes, however, this goes. So I really do sort of respect that a lot. But it does go to show and speak to the issues around tokenism in the, in the first place. Um, it's really difficult especially when your community you're seen or people that go out to your party haven't necessarily been introduced to the person that you want to bring in in maybe the correct way it kind of always feels like you're using them a little bit you know especially again if they tick certain boxes it's always going to feel like you're using them for your own kind of um way to appear that you're being progressive and whatnot and it's not really pushing anything forward it's not really helping anybody and if anything it just kind of leaves a sour taste in the mouth of the people on the dance floor um 
because as much as I despise some of the tech house deep house stuff, I can also appreciate if they're there to hear that sort of stuff and they suddenly are kind of blitzed with 140 BPM plus Euro um, trash, hardcore techno vibes, whatever else people play, then of course I can understand why you're upset because to go to Printworks isn't cheap. That venue at the time when it was open was like a 30 pound plus venue, maybe even more. So you're paying all that money, you're hiring a babysitter, you're going out to these places to go and you're going to play to to go dance and shit and then here you are being suggested to music that you didn't want to listen to because you specifically booked a ticket to see an afterlife event not to see an event with someone like a Patrick Mason playing but again like I said I respect the kind of steadfastness that he had in terms of no I'm going to play what I want to play um, if you guys don't like that fair play and I'm sure in the end it might have maybe affected him because maybe they're like you know what we're not going to book you again and I'm sure with how small the DJ world is that might affect your other gigs and shit but it does go to show about the confidence that he has to be like you know what this is what i'm in here for um i would rather die um you know on my own shield than be able to go out on the, someone else's so i can really respect that one so big up patrick mason and you know i've always had a bit of a um soft spot for him anyway because i feel like he's my weird dj spirit animal just because of the of, of of me seeing the fucking progression over the years i think it was like what over five years maybe or maybe less than that from the times i saw him before covid all the way until now to suddenly becoming this globe trotting dj that's playing you know i think he mentions in the interview he had like 30 gigs or something plus in a month or something so a stupid amount of output and you can see that he clearly went from being somebody playing like a, what i would say was what my level was in terms of playing in hotel lounge bars playing for friends small independent parties and then slowly but surely getting to a place where he's got like a proper agent touring manager and shit he's flying you know all around the world playing these glitzy places it's quite incredible to see to be honest so big up patrick mason and it's nice to see the growth Next, talking about growth and stuff, there's this really cool article courtesy of um, Architects Digest that came out a while ago regarding the one and only Dixon um, featuring his home in Berlin and how he's basically spruced it up. And it looks absolutely beautiful. It really, really does. Um, the title is At Home With Dixon. This is how a DJ lived in the capital of techno. Um, it's funny to see that he actually lived in Berlin and his house looks like a house you see in Berlin or the interior design, but the vibe is very much not Berlin. It's kind of like purposefully toned it down so that it could be like a bit of a respite from all the craziness that he has to get up to on a, to, you know, on a daily basis when he's out on tour. So I really do like um, that approach from him. So if you see the actual article itself, scrolling down here, courtesy of AD, let me just get it up on you. It says, um, being on the road is routine for Dixon. This is obviously translated from German, so it's going to be a little bit funky with the grammar, so please forgive me. Um, there have been times when he has been traveling for more than half a year sometimes for days sometimes for weeks the home of stefan berkman that's the real name of the of dixon is in berlin the city that is more closely interwoven with the culture and music here in the west of, Dick, of berlin um dixon stands in a corner of his bedroom leaning against a cool wall points to a laminated sorry a lime plastered arch opposite it says this is my meditative corner a place that you can't quite place he could be anywhere and first of all the high ceilings absolutely amazing um the flooring absolutely amazing all the custom sort of cabinets and whatever this little gold thing or this little this really big gold amazing thing in the middle is basically the kitchen counter that has the gas stove on it it has loads of cabinets it has an oven and it's just been made to look like a cube with all these little um compartments i'm sure that are drawers and stuff that you can pull out that's been custom designed which looks incredible um again nice big rooms i love some of the paneling and the borders on some of the doors and stuff is absolutely gorgeous looking um it's all been renovated by him and an architectural firm that he kind of hired to put this stuff together um it says here that i quote we wanted to neutralize the comfort of the old building without destroying the core elements um and i also love the fact that apartments in berlin like much like places like in new york and stuff have this ability where they could be like really small looking like a paris london apartment but it could also be incredibly huge where they kind of look like a massive house or mansion type of thing so i like that vibe because as much as i have want to as much as i would want to live in a house nowadays and have the ability to have a garden and shit i also do like the convenience of having the ability to live on one floor that's why maybe I understand why people love to live in like maisonettes and shit. Um, because those places you can basically, you know, you can build out as far as you want, but you don't have to kind of build upwards and you can have the ability to just have, you know, basically everything on the same level, especially when you're moving furniture around. It's pretty handy to do all this type of things. Um, it continues here. Got some nice detailing here on the column. Um, it says, yeah, we didn't want it to look like a kitchen studio emphasizes Anna of, 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 um, 
it says in the kitchen all the work surfaces are traditional the same height and that doesn't make sense to him so his gas hobs are now lower so that you can see the pots better and the work surfaces are higher so that you don't have to bend down necessarily the oven disappears in the built-in row designed by ebbers because we didn't want it to present like a trophy so you've got this whole entire thing which is basically where the kitchen stands that's where the hobs are and shit you see it there right all the hobs you've got places here where you can put other things and shit it's just like an amazing i've never actually seen a kitchen or a an, a kitchen island or whatever designed in this way especially in the middle like it, like it is usually you see these things on a side or whatever but have it in the middle is quite interesting i'm sure for the ventilation it probably works best as well but i just like the fact that most of all the stuff the stuff the, the, the other and all the other compartments is basically hidden in this huge mirrored um glass box they got in the middle it's really really cool it kind of reminds me a little bit of the crystal maids as well if you remember that show from back in the day um it says here as well in general um you hardly find a technology in the home which is a cool little thing. Think about that. You hardly find any technology in the home of the art and media of Fierce and DJ, who together founded the fashion label Together We Dance. There is only a music box that looks a bit like a lost in the kitchen. In contrast to the performance in a club, music at home does not have to impress with our science technology. It says, it's not that we don't like listening to music, it says Anna Ofak, whose calm demeanor often hides subtle humor when it comes to um, the unbuilt technology. You're extremely undemanding. So that's a really interesting approach he's this famous world touring dj um music basically rules his life he's got his own label bloody blah, blah 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 puts on these amazing parties everything is basically music infused and in his entire home there's not a lot of technology and there isn't like a sound system like a bespoke sound system there's not like a rotary mixer in the living room there's not a dj pioneer set up somewhere in the bedroom nothing or the only thing that's there is just living stuff like to eat sleep drink or whatever it may be and i feel like that's probably the best balance a touring dj like a dixon or somebody on that level could need the ability to go home and literally unplug not have to be surrounded by the same thing just running about when you go out and stuff which also goes to show that most likely touring dj life is not as always kind of you know it's not also always shaped up to be maybe after a certain point in time things do get a little bit formulaic things do get a bit boring and whatever and the last thing that you want to be doing is be surrounded by people that you're surrounded by in the clubs when you go home or that similar self of vibe you want to just completely disconnect from it so i really do like that he's kind of taken that approach um especially when you consider there was a time when dixon was complaining about the amount of gigs he was doing right which is a fucking privilege in its own but also goes to show just how much it was maybe taking over overtaking his life i remember reading earlier interviews how important his family was to him the balance that he had you know to be able to go home and kind of unwind with his kids and his family blah 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 so it's good to see See that he's kind of that sort of like hesitation nervousness anxiety has also played its way into the design so that the house is somewhat stripped back and bare so that he can unplug and he can disassociate and then most likely this probably adds to the fact that his performances are so good mostly consistently because of that disconnect i feel like because he's not all the way out partying every single night he has a good time when he goes i'm sure but then when he's at home he's at home and it completely turns off i think that balance is super super necessary here in berlin is my job to focus on release of politics and contracts it says um it's only when i'm on the road in a taxi on a plane in a hotel room that i engage with music professionally wow okay interesting so no music business or anything gets done at home he says only when i'm on the road in a taxi on a phone or in a hotel room so that's only when it, that that thing happens i need a vacuum at home um, that's why there's no studio here instead art by alicia quade michael dean um Gautam gush alexander Dom domanovich and sanya katravoski so loads of art and stuff but no music no nothing respect that respect it the apartment is still not a museum yet it conveys a complete com a complete a contemplative feeling some rooms seem almost sacred it's fitting when you know how dixon fans flock to the clubs as if it were their church the djs and his wife are also looking for a transitional experience in their own way trans moderna another joint project which offic has created director um they use the club immersively play around with a world of light and videos of virtual reality and let the music sounds get under your skin they mention a lot of the wife in this article 
And it's clear, especially when you think of the picture that's leading the article, right? It's both of them standing um, in front of this amazing gold um, sort of like work surface flipping kitchen thing they got going on there, right? Um, his wife, Anna Ofak. It's very clear that most likely why this relationship works, because I remember that, um, you know, interview with, um, what's his face? I've got the DJ's name on, on Twitter, who basically went on Nelk and basically was like, hey, no DJ, like professional who's married is faithful. I think 90% of them aren't because it's just impossible to be be faithful and to have a stable relationship when you're on the road DJing as much as that as he is and I thought that made sense but it also was a little bit more it was a little bit um it was a little bit sweeping in that in that terms because I feel like there's people who are older most likely who are able to kind of balance that a lot easier I think when you're a younger dude and you're just coming into a bit of fame a bit of money it probably is a lot harder to kind of hold down a relationship while you're being on the road and you're doing that touring life but I would imagine if you're a little bit longer in the tooth, you have a little bit more experience, the allure of the outside and of like groupies and stuff isn't as much as when you were younger. It doesn't really, it's the same thing. It just keeps repeating itself every year, different faces. Maybe they get younger, maybe they change, but it's not different, you know? So I completely understand where they're coming from. But maybe the key to their successful relationship, especially in the dance music space, is either having somebody that's completely divorced from what you do, or somebody that's involved with what you do. There's no in between, you know? You have to have somebody that can, has their own thing going on, where they're working, buddy, blah, blah, keeping themselves busy. Or that person is directly involved with your business, whether they, they do your accounts, they're your manager, whether like um, Dixon's wife here, they're a creative director of various projects that you got going on and shit. That's probably really important to kind of keep in their relationship marriage somewhat solid that she has some involvement so you're kind of plugged in and aware of what's going on maybe you go to certain gigs yourself bloody blah, blah blah especially when they're in the home city or places that you can maybe travel with the kids all those things are super super important you would imagine into making sure they have a stable somewhat of a stable relationship so maybe that kind of plays into it because there is a lot of mention of her in the article which is quite nice to see and it's not just him saying hey i'm the fucking wizard here um it's cool that he's kind of basically saying hey because she kind of provides a stable family home when i go back and it's completely divorced from what i do when i'm on the road it kind of helps us to kind of do what i'm doing and so it basically in a way that he's saying you'd imagine um there's all this also this look at this amazing bathroom you've got this great kind of exposed granite like look on the tub and i love how this door here is all blue in the arch that's so great um it says here yeah, the the just Yorge Ebers sorry designed the bathroom as a homage to Japanese unseen spas. The extra tall bathtub with the altar appeal has a side opening that allows water to drain for the center of the room absolutely incredible in Berlin where Dixon began his career in the 1990s we are very grateful for our home he says um uh, leaning on a window ledge looking at the husband and Japanese inspired bathroom this space pays homage to the unseen culture the tub a wash bin and wall paneling are pers uh, pers uh, puristic design sorry made from light Italian natural stone that your gabbers likes to use hidden in the walls is a brush shrine with a space of a sp single candle everything is in flow literally because of the water and the bathtub a detail that exemplifies how the smallest intervention can have the major aesthetic impact one of the other things that Corner have mentioned as well looking at the space is that this is probably why I think great cities are the way they are, especially Berlin, even though it's kind of a bit, you know, run down. It looks like a bit of like a bomb site. One of the great reasons why I think it's a good place to go for a weekend trip for a lot of people out there, even if you're not into dance music, is that it's one of those weird places where regardless of what you're into, you can find it. So if you just want to go on tourist sort of jaunts, checking out landmarks and shit, going to galleries, going on a little food tour, going on a pub crawl, going to watch fucking sporting events, cultural events, club, you can find a, the wave that you're on. You don't need to go down the whole techno clubbing thing that I'm always on. It doesn't need to be that. You can literally go and just have a touristy, time out you know i you know fucking watching loads of people walking by and stuff in cool parks checking out landscapes cool architecture whatever it may be that can exist and you could also if you want to i'm assuming when you have homes you could be in the heart of the city where all that hustle and bustle is happening or if you want to be a bit far out you can do that also because this is in the west so most likely he might live somewhere around like the weddingy type of area right which is a little bit more i would say grown up but there's a lot more families there it's not as crazy as maybe places like noi cloning 
Kreuzberg and all this southern malarkey. It's a bit more out of the way, so you don't need to be communicating or crossing paths with people that party all the time. So that's probably very important. And maybe you'll probably get a lot more space for your money out there too, because it's not in the heart of everything that's bustling, which I assume is probably not the case because Berlin is probably expensive everywhere nowadays. But I think that kind of adds to it um, overall. So that's why I usually recommend places like Berlin and places like that to go to, even places like Madrid and Barcelona, because I feel like they have the ability to be whatever holiday you want it to be do you want to go get fucked do you want to go get high do you want to have a good time do you want to eat do you want to drink whatever you can kind of find it whereas i feel like places like london the reason why it's a bit of a shit city is there's only certain things you can do really after after a while it's just kind of the same shit um you, you kind of have to be on a certain flow and that's basically what you have to kind of do there so i really did enjoy this article like i said i really did enjoy the fact that the house is completely divorced from music um there's loads of books here um, hardly any musical equipment and it's kind of all done purposely um, as a way to kind of have it be a, an oasis um, from all of the things that Dixon's kind of exposed to when he's out there on the road doing his normal DJing tour life thing so big up Architectural Digest big up Dixon big up his wife as well um, for obviously holding it down and being a good collaborator and partner in crime and as per usual as the saying goes happy wife happy life in it happy wife happy blood clot wife moving on from that one we've got this funny hilarious post courtesy of kurok um which shows eon connor sharing a message from kanye that he's sending to elon that he posted on i think on his instagram like odd 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 situation we're in at the moment so i guess elon and kanye are having some sort of behind the scenes beef I'm not too sure if that's because of Ye saying he was going to come back on Twitter. He hasn't come back here. I don't know what's going on there. They have some sort of always back and forth situation going on between them. But Ian Connor decided to share a text message that I'm guessing Ye told him to put out there on social so that everybody knows what's going on and maybe to send a message out there to Elon. Or like most things with Ye, most likely this was a private conversation that he took public. Ye's superpower is doing that. He loves to take a private discussion you're having with somebody and to force them to do what he wants he'll just blast it out on social media he does this all the time He's, he uses a tactic that kind of works to be fair but i think nowadays people are so used to the you know the tism drenched nature of it that people are a little bit over it and don't really give a fuck it doesn't really have the same punch it used to have but this used to be a thing that you should do all the time because i'm guessing a lot of these people are never in a position where their private dms or private text messages ever get blast but i think because they're texting yay some of them probably know deep down this will probably end up online anyway so it's not something that kind of shocks them in that regard so let's see the flipping text in full right this is courtesy of ian connor's social media i want to see the four things so i don't have to flip in keep going on it so um president yay right so i guess there's a screenshot from yay personally that he's sending out to elon no i think it's, it's a screenshot taken from yay's phone that he sent to um ian connor ian connor for some reason has kanye listed as president yay right that's probably the ultimate form of glazing to be completely honest but hey what can you do um so yeah ian connor saying to him all oh, my word all praise to be allah and he posts a screenshot of what yay said to elon in a text um yeah I said to elon in a text a while back ago i guess i don't know when when are we going to speak you owe me nothing <laughs> i love those two contrasting conflicting sentences right when are we going to speak you owe me nothing okay cool um you never have to speak to me again but if we do speak the nature of relationship has to change i'm not bipolar i have signs of autism from my car accident <laughs> yay thinking you could get autism from a car accident says everything about him yay thinking autism is caused by head trauma is legitimately one of the most yay things i've ever seen that's definitely in the you know ivermectin cures fucking covid lane of things you know what i mean it's just one of the things where i'm sure there's some loose evidence to say that this thing does happen this way i'm sure some levels of head trauma can cause significant changes in people i understand true but just to say it as fact like that so matter of fact so matter of factly is kind of insane to be honest but hey what can you do um you can't watch kim keep my kids from me and i never understood this line of thinking that yay has where he thinks it's everyone's responsibility to step in for him in this domestic parental dispute he's having with kim kardashian we don't know what's going on behind the scenes but more often than not i was always taught 
never to really get involved in people's relationships, especially when it involves with children. It's just not none of your business. You'd never know what's happening behind closed doors. And the people who appear to be the most perfect and public might be doing the most fuckery behind the scenes. We never know, right? So as much as it can be um, tempting to sort of like ragdoll or jump on or pile on Kim and defend Ye in this regard, we really don't know what it must be like to be married or to have children at the time, or to be married at the time, or to be ma- or to have children with Ye as a person, especially going through what he's going through, the state he's currently in, how he's changed over the years. It's probably not the easiest. I'm sure it's not the easiest for Ye either to be having kids with Kim, but still, it's none of our business. So the fact that he keeps saying these type of things to randoms or to people or even online, you guys all watched out, stood by, she took my kids, I can't see it. It's like, look, it's none of our business. Sort it out in the courts if you need to. Talk to her directly. What can we do about it? Do you know what I mean? What, we're nobody's here. It continues here though. And not say anything publicly and then call yourself my friend so I can bring my audience to your struggling platform. I love that's the way that he tries to get people on song on on his, you know, to kind of have his back by basically insulting them, insulting their work and saying, hey, you need me more than I need you. When you, when we talk, we must be friends, right? Uh, when we talk, then she, she has to change. But the fucking, <laughs> the, the autism caused by head trauma fucking line literally killed me. It sent me. That was the most yay thing I've ever seen or heard in my entire life that he honestly does think that his autism was caused by a car accident that he had many many years prior to when he had this breakthrough breakdown or whatever he wants to call it it's absolutely crazy that he kind of thinks that way and maybe again i think once you reach or once you once you watch if you ever get to around to watching this new documentary of yay that leaked recently um you'll notice quite quickly that he has a lot of i won't say enablers or yes men because they don't really say yes or anything they just stand by and watch him right he just goes on these rants he says these things that he says he says that these batshit comments and no one really i won't say pulls him up on it but it's not really like a normal way of like hanging out or being friends with somebody it's sort of like he just says what he says and people either don't agree do agree or just sit there silently it's very strange to see in real time but a lot of that maybe has enabled him or you know encourage him to think as if like what you're saying has any sort of reverence or is any sort of way true i don't really know what the deal is but it's a very strange thing so when i look at Ye and i hear him speak as much as i would like to blame him for a lot of the things that he does a lot of it i think has to do with the you know the nature of his relationships with people growing up in the scene the fact that he's always been a ge- musical genius a design genius and stuff the, the the levels of his fucking fame you're always going to attract certain people who just want to be there to kind of clout off of you do you know what I mean to suck you dry so it makes sense why he's a little bit of a freak in that way and he doesn't really communicate like a normal person he doesn't seem to have any ability to kind of you know um color i won't say calibrate or read a room or anything i know it's just a strange way he kind of communicates especially when you consider how old he is and how long in the truth he's been into the industry the fact that he acts the way he does i think is more of a um, representation of how destructive and how toxic the industry can be when you're a star because they can enable you and then when you're kind of past their use they can kind of just abandon you and leave you to do your own thing and then basically watch, watch and watch and see as you crash out in 4k but it's safe to say most likely this text from Elon won't this text to Elon, sorry, won't have the necessary effect that he's hoping it would have. Um but yeah, Ye is out here telling Elon he's got a shit up, he's struggling, he needs him more than he needs you, and that he's not bipolar. <laughs> he's got autism from a car crash. It's like uh I don't think that's a better thing, really, to be fair. If that is true, I don't think that actually makes you look any more better than what you think it does. But hey, what do I know? What do I know? Oh yeah, and there's this other story that was going somewhat viral on my side of the internet too regarding the new creative director for supreme so as most of you all know uh tremaine emery from denim tears was previously the creative director of supreme that ended in disaster because of some conflict he had with supreme he allegedly accused them basically accused them not allegedly he accused them of being systemically racist because of some disagreements he had with designs that he was trying to put forward in that and all the kind of backlash around that so a lot of people were speculating on who the new creative director would be and i suggested from the beginning that I probably think if you take in what Tremaine said in an interview recently with Torre, 
if you believe what he said in terms of the conflict he was having already bef when he started outside of the, his designs getting rejected he had a, he was butting heads with a lot of people who were to supreme um he mainly named this woman called erin mcgee who's kind of a bit of a streetwear legend because she's one of the first people to have a, like a somewhat prominent streetwear brand back in the day um for women called made me and she's been at supreme for many many years since then i, I remember her working there back in the day because i remember her name also being attached to supreme but i didn't know she was still there this whole time so she's been there for a while and Tremaine mentioned on the Torre show that apart from him thinking that she was racist, um, basically without saying, he also said that her, him and her butted heads. And the reason why he said that is because she felt like she should have got the creative director role because she's been there long. She's a woman. She's meant to be queer. She ticks all these boxes and shit. So she thought she was going to get a job before Tremaine. And then Tremaine gets it and then she's a bit pissed off, especially because he's external and maybe because she thinks she's better than him. Who knows? And since then, they were biting heads from the beginning. And I think he also was responsible. No, was she responsible? I don't know. I think she's one of the people who was kind of trying to push Supreme doing a collaboration with um, the fashion guy from Belgium. I forgot his name. I think it's Walter something, right? Um, who had beef with Virgil. And um, she was one of the people pushing that collaboration forward, according to Tremaine, basically. And um, what other people in the company were like, nah, because of how he treated Virgil. And then Supreme basically declined that collaboration out of respect for Virgil. Bloody blah, blah, blah. Whoever you believe, whoever you believe. But I said when I heard that rumor or the stories from Tremaine and reading between the lines what happened to him at Supreme, I said the thing that they could probably only do now going forward is to either hire somebody who's completely malleable, who knows how to work in the corporate industry, who already has their own brand, or to just do away with this whole glitzy creative director thing and just hire someone from within. Now, they probably can't do that because I'd imagine the whole reason why they hired a creative director externally had something to do with the VF Corp investment. I'm sure the VF Corp investment, maybe part of it was to expand, uh, you know, to basically build on the, the company's growth already, hire more people, open more stores. And if they could, you know, top it off by having somebody well known take the creative director role, it kind of adds to the allure and the uh, clicks that the Supreme would get, right? Because it'd be a big story in media and stuff if somebody well known in streetwear or fashion wants to get a creative director role. So I was saying, hey, either you scrap it all together or you hire somebody in the house, but most likely you can't do that because VF Corp said you have to hire somebody big and famous. So if it's someone big and famous, somebody has to be completely malleable to work in the corporate industry who's not going to maybe who's going to work well with others and it isn't going to think they're actually in charge because they're not because as Tremaine mentioned in the interview with Torre um James Jebbier is basically still the creative director and still runs the show at Supreme um you just kind of you have your role but you still kind of answer to him and you always have kind of final say so so when this Roma got put out about um, advisory board crystals it did make somewhat a lot of sense because of how they go about business how quickly they've kind of grown and the fact that they've always to me looked like a an urban outfitters brand if that makes any sense not as like a derogatory dig at them but it's never really stood out to me but it's always been quite successful it kind of feels like a a more commercial version of online ceramics i'm not going to lie i always thought they were kind of the same thing um it took me a while to realize that they're completely different things online ceramics and, and advisory um board crystals but it did make some sense when this rumor first was floated on social media that the advisory board crystals um duo and couple would be taken over as creative directors for supreme and obviously with it being a man and woman and you've got those kind of you know boxes ticked also the fact that they're already running their own brand and the fact that they're quite commercial already i think they'd probably be able to work within the corporate structure of supreme a lot easier than maybe denim tears had been being a what some of an independent brand doing on his own and the type of stuff that he designed to make more sense but it has now been cleared up courtesy of supreme that this is not the case so that story has completely been confuffed but let's read it anyway from the original story to the update it says original story los angeles based label advisory board crystals was founded by remington guest and heather harbour in 2015 after an unexpected joint uber ride uh, um, by the blood, let's scroll down here. His year, his year and a half, let's talk about Tremaine here. His year and a half long stint was cut short due to systemic racism, sharing text messages with Supreme leaders on Instagram. I left Supreme because of the systemic racism issues the company has a treatment of Arthur Jaffa um, collaboration. Um, Heather Guest, sorry, Guest and Harbour's appointment would set Supreme on a new path um, to set the new creative directors. Harbour would also become Supreme's first female leader. ABC's recent history um, aligns with the brand's target market, seeing seasonal collections gain virality through Kif and NBA Vans collaborations. So this alleged was a story. Um, if that was to be true, it would be a little bit of a downgrade. I feel like 
if you're a supreme fan and you complain about denim tears getting the job or sorry tremaine getting a job the founder of denim tears you should have just as much complaints about advisory board crystals because i think they're on the same levels in terms of execution like if you don't like denim tears i don't think you can stand here and say that advisory board crystals is doing anything kind of you know um forward thinking it's not really it's basically the same sort of stuff sweats t-shirts you know other bits and bobs cut and sew stuff but it's really not nothing that special that you'd think would kind of warrant somebody getting hired by supreme you'd think so right cool so that'd be my initial thing but the other thing i think about as well is that it's kind of funny if it was to be true because this is the complete opposite of what tremaine is right this is like the most whitest brand you could find um compared to the most blackest brand you can find even though his brand now has been co-opted by the whites out there but still this would be an incredible incredible turn if they did this because it would kind of go to show that maybe they culturally didn't understand how to maybe work with somebody like a Tremaine especially within this kind of you know very sensitive heightened political social times we're living at the moment where the politics and everything is kind of interwoven with everything that we're kind of doing even though it shouldn't be maybe the way to do it is to get a very malleable Caucasian people right who run their brand a certain way maybe a little bit more um, adjusted to working within a big corporate structure so that would make somewhat level of sense but then the more again you think about it the more you think about what them tears that you think to yourself you know what that was probably the one shot they took which they would never take again which is again some of the reasons and the problems where people when they fall out with companies the way he did and when it ends the way it does it sometimes has some really bad and negative effects on other people who maybe could have got the job because of how bad it went for you they've now been stung their hands have been burned they're not going to go through that again because you know as much as he would like to believe he's like you know the supreme designer and he's the best in the world at everything it goes to so it goes i don't think most people would say like jermaine's the most gifted designer in the world maybe he's got great ideas but not the most gifted designer in the world cool the fact that they took a chance on him i thought was more of a credit to supreme then more of a credit to him because it showed that they're willing to give somebody on the face of it who's maybe just new to the scene hasn't necessarily you know ha been in fashion that long or clothes making that long to give him that sort of chance goes to show how maybe forward thinking they are and maybe it was a bit of a sign as to why they've been around for so long but now that it didn't work out the way they wanted it to work out it wouldn't also surprise me to say like you know what we took that one chance never again let's either hire somebody in-house quietly or hire somebody face Let's quietly or just do it with the people that you know or just basically scrap the whole thing which they probably can't but that will make more sense so i'm not surprised when the update came out and it says according to the official representative in supreme the brand is denying the rumor and labeling it as fake no official announcement on the new appointment has been made so the initial rumor anyway when it did come out was that the lady from um, cactus plant flea market is the one that's now been working unofficially at supreme in that creative director role that's what people have been saying so either that rumor is true or that rumor is false i'm not too sure but it seems like there's something happening behind the scenes i'm not sure what's going on what the deals is but it seems that something's happening because if it was just a complete block off and we're moving on we're not doing this again they would have said it already but the fact that they're you know not really confirming or denying certain things or clarifying certain things except for this of course it leads me to believe that maybe that door is still open that vacancy is still there and they're waiting to find the right candidate or the right fit um you know whatever approach that they can do to kind of make that work going forward so let's see what happens but the rumor about advisory board crystals taking over supreme as creative directors has completely been debunked as high piece is saying here and it's not going to happen unfortunately which i think is a good thing because that advisory board crystals brand is it's a bit shit to be fair like i said i'd much rather wear online ceramics um, it just looks like overpriced fucking urban outfits to me and yeah just not for me in the slightest not for me in the slightest and again if you don't like denim tears but you like you know a, 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 what you call it advisory board crystals you're probably racist <laughs> according to Tremaine and I'd actually have to agree because that brand is fucking terrible like please I'd, I'd have to agree if that, if that was the case I'd have to agree because this is just like white people's gallery department isn't it really and truly look at the pictures here on social media or on google sorry this is basically just white people's gallery department maybe they would say gallery departments black people's um advisory board crystals i don't think so but i just think this is what it is this is white people's um gallery department and i'm just not for it personally for me i'm just not for it but hey what do i know what do i know so that's been the existing show episode number 718 
Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. Sorry, this has been a bit of a short one. Just wanted to put this out there for you for the start of the week. And obviously, I'm going to come back with some longer ones throughout the rest of the week. So do not delay. Do not be, uh, you know, saddened or anything. I shall be back very soon. Thank you for those of you who have tuned in. I do appreciate you. If you do watch this via the premiere on YouTube, make sure that you are smashing the like button for me and leave me comments down below if you've enjoyed the show. If you listen to this via the audio podcast, of course, of course, make sure that you share it. Leave me a fast star review. That would be greatly appreciated appreciated and apart from that really thank you for joining in nothing more to be said there as i'm heading out you'll hear my tune today playing underneath my voice and i'll see and hear from you guys again very very soon but for now take care peace